Hello everyone, happy to welcome you back on board to our 360 degrees masterclass series. We're introducing you today to the particles of brands and employer branding playbook with incredible speakers and instructors connecting from Dubai, London, Luxembourg, Lille and Warsaw. Uh, please note that you'll have two workshops to choose from after the panel discussion and quiz. Workshop one, the Unicorn Employer Branding Playbook. Workshop two, the power of brands. Let's get it started by introducing our speakers of the day. She has been elected among the top 40 marketers under the age of 40 in MENA by the region's leading marketing trade magazine in 2017. And connecting from Dubai, Miss Christine Hart, Vice President of Marketing at Visa. In her role, she oversees integrated media and creative campaigns, drives op operational efficiencies, and fosters Visa's digital transformation. Before joining the company, she served as global luxury lead and head of marketing at Facebook. Earlier, she has held different leadership roles at top-class marketing brands such as Nike and Red Bull. Uh, she holds an MBA from IE Business School and a Master's in Marketing from Panteo Sorbonne. Connecting from the UK, we have Miss Anka Pintilie, Head of Marketing and Employer Branding WFS Europe, described by her former employees at Revolut as the guru of employer branding. The, to only mention a few milestones of Anka, uh, at Oracle she was Head of Employer Branding in charge of setting up and developing Oracle's employer branding function, including an international center of excellence before taking on its creative hub as a director. At Revolut, she was in charge of building the firm's global employer branding function from the ground up following the mantra, stay lean, stay hungry, and think like a founder. As a moderator, we have Mr. Troy Bishop, Head of Marketing and Communications for KPMG Luxembourg, where he is leading a digital transformation to create data-driven content experiences that build brand value and drive long-term growth. Before relocating to Luxembourg, Troy served as Creative Director for Deloitte Insights in the U.S. He oversaw the design and delivery of award-winning integrated media content that built eminence for the world's most valuable commercial services brand. During this time there, Deloitte rose from uh, eight, number 18 to number one in just three years. As a former actor uh, who has appeared in an Academy Award-winning film, Troy has an extensive experience creating and telling stories using design, data, and technology. Troy... Uh, it's an honor to have you with us today, ladies and gentlemen. The screens are yours. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak with uh, both Anka and Christine, two real experts in terms of employer branding. Time is short. Let's jump in. Uh, what I've found in my experience is there's often a little confusion between branding and marketing. And employer branding in particular, it's, uh, it's been around a little while, but I find that it is still not well known or understood as corporate branding. Christine, so to what is employer branding? And what is the difference between a corporate brand and an employer brand? First of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure uh, being with you today. Uh, the way I would like to start is to think about a company reputation. So to understand the importance of reputation, uh, it's first important to understand what it actually means. And if we are to dive into, for instance, the Oxford Dictionary to understand uh, its definition, uh, it's something that is defined as the beliefs or opinions that are generally held about someone or something. So what it means in a nutshell is that if every single person creates a specific image in its head based on the experience that they've had with a particular company. And that experience can be um, from an ad they've seen, from the way, for instance, the company shows up on social media, or even thoughts about the products, the leaders, or even uh, the team members. And while it is extremely hard to control perceptions, uh, it's important for companies to invest in their brand strategy and make sure that they create that particular image of themselves uh, in, in people's minds. And the reason being is, first of all, this image will need to be consistent, both internally and externally, and will need to be driven in, in a similar way across all the touch points that are uh, related to the company. 
So if we're to think of reputation, I would just say that the reputation is the brand itself. And if we're to zoom into the employer branding, to your point, it's something that hasn't been that common uh, previously. Now more and more companies develop what uh, we can call their second brand, which is their employer brand. And the employer brand uh, describes an employer reputation as a place to work and their employee value proposition, as opposed, I would say, to the more general corporate brand reputation and value proposition to customers. Anka, you said, which I love, bad hiring decisions can ruin you and that the t winning the talent war is not optional, which I love. What is the role of employer branding and what are the keys to getting started in terms of, of developing that uh, employer branding for a firm? Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to drop some numbers. I love working with numbers and I think they resonate really well, uh, potentially with the people on the call that are either within startups, uh, planning to found a startup or, you know, in the startup area, maybe, maybe it resonates a bit more. About f six and a half million businesses get set up every year and about 50% of those survive more than five years and some of them even thrive. About 70% of those are in tech. We're talking fintech, health tech, AI, gaming, ad tech, educational tech, clean tech. I can go, I can go on forever. All sorts of, of technology companies. About 30% of them say that their growth has been hampered as a result of not being able to hire the right employees to attract the right talent. So we all know you can't scale without the right talent. And also there's a cost that comes with hiring the wrong talent as well. Between seven to 10,000 euros ends up costing a business. This is the average cost of hiring the wrong individual uh, within a country, within a company at either entry or mid level. The cost of hiring the wrong manager in a company ends up being up to 40,000 euros. So not only that is not optional, it's actually the numbers do not make sense for your business unless you start thinking about hiring the right talent. To hire the right talent, you need to go and play the game or let's just say you go to go into that war that is not optional. Um, and, and just start thinking about what it takes. What are the things that you have in your toolbox when you go and talk to candidates? As a startup, you're probably going to think your product or your founder, but that's only going to take you so far. You have to start thinking about your brand a bit differently and the pillars that actually sit behind your employer brand, the one that you're selling to your potential talent. Great. So, I mean, going back to that, you've hit on something again, you know, the difference between marketing or recruitment marketing and branding. For, you know, building a brand is takes time to hit all the touch points across the employee journey or the customer journey as well. I mean, how do you influence or build an authentic brand when you have very limited time to make an impression? And especially maybe when even leadership is, is expecting quick results. All right. Um, you need to start by defining exactly what you're selling. So again, a, a startup, for example, is a company that is working to solving a problem where a solution is not obvious, success is not guaranteed. Um, when people join your company, they actually forego the, the, the stability in exchange for the promise of tremendous growth or excitement of making immediate impact. You need to decide, again, which, depending which stage of, of, of your company are you, you're going to use different tools. At the beginning, your employer brand in a startup will be driven by the founder's personal brand. Then it's going to be the product. And then you move to company behavior. So depending which stage you are, you need to be very mindful of this because it gets very fast from being reliant solely on the founder's brand and the product to actually having to sell the culture. So that's why employer branding for every startup needs to, needs to work in conjunction with, with the culture, not necessarily as a function, but whatever is employer branding sells, this is, this is employer branding sells what you produce internally. So what are you producing internally by hiring different types of people? So 
and you need to be very much aware that when you go and pitch to new candidates, you're selling the future, but they need to work with the present. So how does the present look like? And maybe it sounds a bit um, abstract, but about 82% of the people that come into your company, they're buying into your behavior, actually, which is something that can either, you know, um, it secures their growth or it gives them a bit of hope that they can actually work with you on the long run. When it comes to recruitment marketing and employer branding for, again, for smaller companies, don't go big. Just stay a bit closer to home and try to be authentic. It's more of an iterative process that you have to go through rather than just try and define and label yourself from the beginning and, and think, okay, so I know what I am. I'm going to work with this for three years in a row. It's not. It's something that requires uh, constant attention. Right. And uh, sorry, another question that I usually get is when do I need to start? Well, once you finish hiring all your friends and family and people who are your fans and your ideas, basically that's when you start your employer branding journey. Great. Uh, Christine, you mentioned the employee value proposition earlier. Can you elaborate? I mean, from at KPMG, we produce a, a regular report, Customer Excellence, where we identify six pillars uh, to the employee value proposition, employee experience. Um, can you elaborate in terms of what should be in that employee value proposition? Sure. So I would say if we look at the recent pandemic and the changes we've been facing uh, recently, there has been a total shift in how employee branding is perceived and, and uh, designed. This year, I would say it has completely redefined the way we work, the way we socialize or the way we engage with the community. And uh, companies are realizing more and more that it is key to bring the customer brand and the employer brand together and converging them in a way to start delivering greater value. Obviously, um, there is lately a greater push for empathy, for transparency. Uh, Anka has mentioned authenticity in employer branding strategy that has played out in different ways. And uh, while there is no playbook today to kind of define uh, the best approach moving forward, there has been some trends recently uh, that have changed the way employer branding is today being developed. And what I would like to do is maybe share five key points that I consider extremely important in developing uh, employer branding. First and foremost, it's about keeping your employer brand relevant in times of transition and adapt to the communication style and content to make sure that it is relevant to your audience. So it's important to keep a pulse on employee on one hand and candidates on the other hand, the candidate sentiment to make sure that the message is still relevant. My second, I would say advice is around compassion. Compassion is king. And according to uh, a recent uh, LinkedIn talent uh, solution study, they found that communicating empathy and authentically showcasing your company is a better long-term solution for growing loyal and lasting connections. So I've mentioned uh, you know, the, the employer brand relevance, compassion is something that is extremely important. I've also mentioned the fact, which is my third point, uh, of the importance of bringing both the corporate and the employer brands together. I would say historically they've been developed in isolation and today the glue between them is the purpose. So really understanding or defining your organization's purpose is the reason uh, it exists. So maybe spending some time on this and understanding what this really is and communicating it and delivering on it uh, effectively are the keys uh, to building brand advocacy. My first point is around employees. Obviously your employees are your fans, your best advocates, so do use them because they are at the heart and soul of the company and they can also represent and showcase um, your, your company essence and your employee branding. 
And my final tip is around uh, staying true to yourself and showing up in a consistent way, both internally and uh, externally. Great. So very quickly, I mean, obviously, we talk about the future of work and changing dynamics. There's the great resignation happening in the US. There are people who are being more selective about where they want to work, uh, changing expectations and attitudes. The points that you just conveyed, how do they apply or are they a result of these changes? Are these, do they endure through the evolution of a brand? I would say it really depends on the brands. Some have been forward thinking and pretty advanced in their employer branding uh, strategy. And, and some of this have been, uh, or, or some of the principles that I've shared have been initiated a while back. Today, what I've mentioned is the need for companies to really shift and, and re-emphasize the, their approach using these specific pillars because the word has changed and the dynamic has changed. So remaining relevant as an example is something that is key. Whatever has worked, I've, I've witnessed, I would say uh, throughout my experience is that companies are not necessarily adaptable. As an example, they work on a strategy, but the word has changed in the meantime, yet the strategy doesn't evolve with it. And getting or, or staying um, uh, agile and staying pretty flexible uh, would be one of uh, the key advices uh, I would give in terms of uh, both employee branding and branding in general, because today I consider that both come hand in hand. They're no longer, you know, completely separate. Obviously, the target audience is different, but the strategy, the approach and the principles are the same. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, obviously a brand is going to be fluid and it has to evolve with a uh, changing situation, changing demographics. Um, not only that, but obviously, I think the uh, Anka you mentioned, you know, there's, there might be different approaches. Where do you start? Depends where you are. Um, you've had experience, Anka, in both smaller organizations, scale ups, and bigger, big tech, bigger organizations. I mean, you're at Amazon, which is obviously huge. Can you elaborate on terms of the differences and approaches uh, in employer branding between the different sides of organizations, scale ups versus big techs? Sure. But maybe just connected to what Christine said before, I think the pandemic kind of leveled the play field on numerous aspects between big companies and small companies. So I think because employer branding in a way has been robbed, culture uh, at the beginning and then employer branding has been robbed of the entertainment piece in a way. Uh, I, we kind of, th we all thought we had it nailed before the pandemic. You have inflatable in the office and you had swings and gourmet coffee and avocado and affinity clubs. And that, I mean, a lot of things, right? A lot of fun in the office. And um, it, it was very tough to compete if you were a smaller company or if you were a bigger company with a bit of more traditional culture, you know, that doesn't actually have these things, you know, as you pass the corridor and everything is very colorful. But the focus now shifted from all that entertainment in a way, which was a lot, I mean, was a big pillar for every employer brand effort out there. It shifted the conversation, the narrative shifted to flexibility, uh, employee first environment, whether it's at home or in the office or whatever. Uh, the meaning of work, and there's a lot more focus on diversity, social injustice, um, inclusive, um, inclusiveness. So there's very the the change, the things, the narrative change, and it's very interesting to see how different companies pick that up. But it's more accessible, I would say, for all companies, irrespective of the size, versus before when again a big chunk of your employer branding content was focusing on work environment. Um, I would say in, in difference between big companies and small companies, it's in big companies, it's you go, you have to, you're kind of compelled to go on a more um, traditional route if you are a conservative or a more cautious route. You go through research and then you put together your whole strategy. That strategy gets, you know, you need to start getting uh, stakeholders into that you need to do all this i remember doing a lot of spending a lot of my time doing um having everyone bought into that strategy all the business leaders depending you know which business they were driving 
everyone had to, had to be onboarded onto the strategy before you actually push that to market. It's a longer process. It takes some time and the reality might change in between. So you have to mitigate that risk when you work for a bigger company and try to find ways of having different iterative processes just so you can keep, keep up with the realities. Um, it was interesting because you also got a different types of support in a bigger company. Um, it's, it's easier to use your employer base because if you work for a company that has 150,000 employees, and it was my, my situation at Oracle, the moment you start using your employee base and ask them, for example, to amplify content or to get engaged with that content, all of a sudden you would have a lot of earned media for your efforts, which you don't necessarily have in a smaller company. In a smaller company, I found out the best way to approach this, the strategic process, but also the execution of the production process, if you will. The strategic process is much shorter. It's very lean. It's small iterative cycles. You're going to have to look at the small wins all the time and drop those and make sure you socialize those internally as you're buying more time to actually build the bigger strategy. Because the focus is what can you give me now? What is it that I can take to market now that's going to have even if a small P impact, but it's something. So that is a bit of a different approach for startups, which was interesting to see. But when it comes to producing content, it was you have, I felt, at least I felt this, you have the freedom to build a team that works almost as a, I don't know, almost as journalists that interact and build relationships and find that piece of news that actually going to bring them a really nice article. It happens in a bigger company as well, but it's a way more structured process. You need to set up the flows and the channels to pull those and capture those, those stories versus a startup. If you have a few hundred people, it's a different story. You actually end up interacting and chasing, chasing the story, the news in, in a different way. So there are different pros, processes with different focuses, but ultimately for all of them, you need to define who you are and what is it you're taking to market? The pillars that Christine mentioned, you have to define the pillars. Is there one around careers? Fine. How do you define career progression in your company? Is it mostly lateral? Are you actually selling, are you selling the roles from the transferable skills perspective? Because you're not going to be able to offer the verticals that all the big companies do. So having this thinking of who you are and exactly what are your points of parity and points of difference with your competitors, whether big or small, it's very important to start from this uh, this part. Uh, Christine, you've worked for some of the biggest brands in the market, uh, Facebook, you know, I believe Red Bull and now Visa. Again, you're in a larger situation, larger organization. What can you add in terms of what you've witnessed um, in the branding process that marketers or smaller organizations can take as a lesson? Sure. Um, I would say even if I've worked uh, for some of the biggest brands, one of the things that I've realized is in some of them, they still had a very entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and this is the, I would say, one of the things that has made me realize that no matter how big or small you are as an organization, remaining or staying agile and, and being ahead of the curve is something that is key uh, to survive. And that's one of the things that obviously you need to do as a startup. Uh, and, and this is one, uh, I would say, of the key advantages uh, they have uh, given the size. Some of the key takeouts, I would say all in all, uh, that I've witnessed across my different organizations uh, that I consider as um, you know, helpful for, for startups is to think of ways to stand out. No matter how big or small you are, the world is pretty small. So how do you manage to differentiate yourself as an organization? Think about the principles of your brand, your purpose. What do you want to stand for? Um, is, is one of the things that is key. Um, I would say the, the second big pillar, and I keep on you know, talking about authenticity, consistency, because one of the things that is key is if you build it right from the beginning, it's easier to build on the right foundation rather than try to be or try to have way too many faces. The principles are the same. 
um, it, it's all about going back to the roots and really understanding what is your purpose as an organization and how can you bring it to life across all your channels, be it uh, whether you speak to, to customers and in, uh, given today's topic to your future candidates, but also to your employees. Uh, then it's about, uh, I would say, my, my, my last point and my key point is to be bold and to dare. Don't try to create um, a watered down version of, uh, you know, what, what another existent brand is doing. Try to create instead content that resonates emotionally. Think about your brand as a human. You know, what qualities do they have? How do they talk? How do they show up? And how do they connect and relate? And this is one of the things that is important. And it doesn't matter whether you have a massive budget or a small budget. Trust me, when you have a smaller budget, you tend to be way more creative with the money that you have because every penny and every dollar counts. Uh, and, and this is where I would say we see the, the biggest uh, innovation and creativity because of that restriction. So don't feel would be my, my, my key message to, to the, the, the startups um, uh, attending today. Don't consider that budget is a barrier. It will push you to just think out of the box and to use the channels uh, and, and potentially your employees or your fans around to push a message in a, in a more consistent, more authentic way and really help you to elevate your employer branding. Um, you test on, you know, being journalists almost, and for myself being heavily into content. Uh, can you maybe elaborate or do you have an example in terms of how you can leverage, and, and this is to Anka too, leverage employer stories to help build out that brand? I mean, we talked about the employee experience sort of as the fundamental to creating that employer brand. How can we then take those stories and, I guess, can express the employee experience? Is, any examples? Sure. So, for example, we were looking into background, um, trying to showcase uh, the diversity in our workforce. You know, you had single moms or you had, I don't know, um, young guys being into golf or whatever. So any sort of interesting, um, we wanted to showcase exactly that can come from all walks of life irrespective of your um, maybe hobbies or previous experience, and you could find a place in the organization. And how the, that, does that background or whatever you do day to day, even on a personal level, would actually help you perform in that environment? Or what are the things that you take out of that environment and actually make you happy? Could it be the interaction with your colleagues? Could it be the fact that you found, I don't know, your tribe, potentially, I don't know, people who are into public speaking, for example, and you found some sort of joy in that. So there was always an angle to this. It's exactly how do you marry your personal with your, your personal and your, your business life? How, what is the meaning of your job, for example? Is it just a role or a title? Is it similar to what you've done before? Or do you feel it's, it's fulfilling from, from a different kind of perspective? So we were, I think we had conversation with, I don't know, maybe a hundred people in the organization to understand what is their background and what is their particular story. If you sit with somebody in a room over a coffee and you talk for about an hour and you know how to ask the right question that create a safe space where they can actually talk about themselves, you're going to find out that although on the surface their stories might sound similar there's so many differentiate po differentiate point that you can actually um bring to light and as you actually put those on a public source and you push them in front of you and, and you start talking about your employees or allowing them to talk about themselves more like than the company talking about the employees and encourage them to even post their own stories on their own channels this is how you start creating uh, all the other people that you want to attract, the, the point is somebody might find a common point with somebody in the company and say, oh, maybe this is a place for me. I can relate to that. The point is create relatable content and it cannot be relatable unless it's relevant to candidates and it's, in, and it's supported by the organization, which means it needs to be very authentic and rooting, rooted in what's happening day to day. 
that's why we, I think a lot of the work um, I've done in the past is take the first few months when you pick up an employer branding function and figure out everything internally first. What are the channels that you use? How do you capture the, that content from candidates? How do you, I don't know, how, how do you actually allow them to come to you? Are they, is it, is it easy for them to reach out to you when they have a story or you're going to, is there a barrier at the moment? So, and these are the things that, and there's one thing that I think we haven't talked about is the, the candidate experience, which is very much important when you when you start looking at employer branding, look at the candidate experience because you can paint a really nice picture. But if, if the candidate starts engaging with your company and it's really not a great experience, no matter what you put out there, it's actually more a, it potentially cr- can create backlash rather than just support your journey as an employer. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I know there's there's communities now which have played an increasing role in terms of both uh, the employee experience and also the customer experience. And from the employee experience, you know, you have communities on Glassdoor, also communities on Reddit, uh, other channels as well, where if a candidate has a bad experience, I imagine it's out there. So really, uh, how does that impact your employer branding? Uh, Christine, did you have anything to add in terms of employer stories? I would say just... And, and just to echo what uh, Anka just said, if you think about uh, you know, your employees, at the end of the day, they're both your customers and your employees. Uh, so really thinking about the experience as a candidate and how they can also um, you know, convey the, the, the company culture and their experience to others is one of the channels to consider. Uh, and it it can also, to a certain extent, if the experience is not as positive, hamper your brand broadly. And that's why I keep talking about the connection between the employer brand and the corporate brand, because at the end of the day, and and at times we speak to the same people, um, and and yeah. I I think that's a key point that it's it's not corporate brand and employer branding that they're very much interconnected and impact each other. Um, Anthony, how are we doing on time? Yeah, so I think uh, I think that we can take a question by Mark Yeo. Mark, are you there? Please unmute yourself quickly. How can large organizations di- differentiate in their story? Christine? Sure, I'll take this question. I- I think what is key and what is important is that these principles are brought to life. Obviously, what we are noticing uh, in big corporation in general is that you have some key topics that are key that are to be addressed. Uh, what is important is to make sure that they're actually, um, you know, um, implemented internally. It's not just about the communication. It's about closing the loop and making sure that they're brought to life. Um, which is how I, I would look at it. Companies can't necessarily differentiate themselves in the sense that, yes, maybe talking about diversity or talking about some key topics that are hot topics lately might be important. But at the end of the day, it's all about making sure that the culture and the people in that organization are what attracts uh, potential candidates. So it's not just about the message, it's about the the real experience that these companies can bring to life through their different channels, um, interviews being being one of them, but also focusing on their employees and finally on their customers. Beautiful. Anything you would like to add, Anka? I was thinking, maybe not necessarily specific to this question, but I think what um, was mentioned in in the question were more like, the way you structure the pillars under an employer brand. So, yeah, you're going to look at diversity. Everybody will. Uh, You're going to look at uh, passions and work challenges and work environment. You can't actually invent the wheel there in terms of the main pillars that you're looking at. But what we need to keep in mind as employer branding um, specialists, it's actually don't try to fill the pillar by chasing specific stories rather than just go and capture the stories, whatever they are. And then you're going to realize if they fit or don't fit your pillars. And sometimes it's so exciting when they don't. 
And actually you realize there's another side of your organization that you're just discovering by talking to people. So yes, it does sound, it might sound commoditized because we all use the same words, but whatever sits in a diversity pillar for a big organization doesn't necessarily reflect in another. It's just like culture or the personality of people, right? We might all say we work for a big company, but we're probably so very different in our approach and, or, and sometimes what we value in our work. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Anke. So now we want to see whether you've paid attention. I will be dropping the access link to the quiz session. So we, I want to have as many people as possible part, taking part in the quiz. Please go ahead and get your sneakers. Let's go. Five, four, three, two, one. And here we go. Mark, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm back in the audio, so sorry. Um, could everyone hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. I thought this was a really interesting um, um, topic. I, I, I really resonate with a lot of um, the, the points. In fact, I think employee branding was a very new topic. I, I think what I take away is really um, employee branding and the corporate band is starting to be integrated with one another and it's becoming more, more relevant, especially with you know a, a lot of the great recognition and all of that. So I thought all the discussion points, the perspectives from large organizations, small organizations, I really enjoyed um, today's topic. So thank you very much um, to all the speakers today. You also get a surprise for you, of course. So Mr. Philip, Westerlund, I think we yes. have paid for him. Yes, congratulations, Mark. You just won a pair of circular sneakers. So we're talking about Ooh. branding and <laughs> circularity is, of course, our branding. So you are very welcome to visit our pop-up display at the Royal Hamilias in Luxembourg. I want to, of course, invite everyone to our store to find out more about what we're building. We're creating a, a circular ecosystem and we are expanding fast so come visit us at the store congratulations again mark and i'll reach out to you separately okay thanks everyone absolutely thank you thank you so much now we want to go over to the workshops so all you need so what i'm going to do right now i'm going to open the breakout rooms and you can assign yourself if you are unable to assign yourself just drop the work w1 or w2 in the chat and we'll be, hap we'll, we'll be happy to assign you. Please go ahead. This is very good. The stereotype, which is of course just a stereotype, is that people who own startups are billionaires. And well, congratulations, but I would assume that this is not that easy as the stereotype says. Um, we know that it's not, it's very difficult to succeed, to be there. It requires true dedication to certain vision. And this vision, this promise is something that you and many other brands are using to sell products and services. We sell our why basically. And here I would like to elaborate more because this why, this vision, this is something that makes a huge difference. And I would like to take, for instance, for the discussion purposes, two brands that you all know very well and understand better what is the difference and what's the phenomenon of Apple. So Apple versus Samsung. If we compare the technicals, uh, it will turn out that Samsung could potentially be much better than iPhone. Of course, I'm an enthusiast of iPhone. I, uh, I'm a happy owner and I would never change it for anything else. But I'm aware also of that, that there are, there are different telephones, smartphones who have definitely much better parameters. And if it comes to iPhone, it's two, sometimes even two times more expensive than the competitors. And like, what's the phenomenon behind this? Why is it happen? What's the why? Mm, the reason why we are choosing Apple instead of other 
smartphones is because Apple brings a promise. It makes us feel someone better, someone special. It gives the impression it is dedicated only to a sophisticated group of people. And come on, we all want to be part of the A-team. This is how Steve Jobs was selling it. This is this is what he was saying. This is how he was pitching his product. He was selling a promise, a vision. That was his why, his true, true very true belief in, in what he was doing. And very in a very, very like perfectly, Simon Sinek explains this within his theory of golden circle, that people are buying our feelings, our dedication, emotions, our vision. They are buying why. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And what you, and what you do simply proves what you believe. And you can ask a question, why am I bringing it while we were supposed to discuss employer branding aspects? Because this is something that should reflect an employer branding strategy as well. And here, I would like to move to our ingredient X. Do you have any idea what could it be? What, what, what is this element that makes each brand unique? There is no wrong answers. Any ideas? Okay, okay. I, I see that we are supportive if it comes to technicals, but with some other questions, not really. Okay, so our ingredient X from employer branding perspective is the culture. Culture is employees and candidates why. This is what we are pitching. This is what we are supposed to pitch. This is what makes us different. This is something that makes us unique. That is why in order to build in in order to build these amazing products and services, you need to share you need to share and sell properly your culture. You're not going to do these amazing products. You're not going to become the billionaire on your own. You need to surround yourself with a great talents. And how you're going to do that if you're not going to sell your vision, you're not going to sell your culture. Let me explain this very, very quickly on a nice another example. So in order to succeed, in order to succeed, you need to find a right, a right companion. You can't do everything on your own. And I'm very happy that it was today mentioned by Anka on the panel discussion that a lot of startups scale-ups unfortunately fail due to the fact that they are not able to attract right talents. And why some of the companies are able to do so and some of those not? You need to have these right talents next to you. Who will give you a hand if not these people? A person who understands the vision and shares the same values as you do will be enough dedicated to take for you, for your company, one step more. That person will be understanding, will be eager to succeed, will be happy to be with your company. And this is someone who you want to attract, especially if you're a scale-up. Okay, so now let's understand what exactly culture is. What stands behind it? How to understand it and how to pitch it correctly? So. Culture compiles a few elements. One of these is mission. And so it's the same that we are pitching to our clients. It's our why. It's also our vision, the purpose, our values. And last but not least, I would say that one of the most important elements here is the authenticity. This is also something that ladies today highlighted a lot during the uh, panel discussion. Everything, everything that we are saying, we should say transparently as much as possible, of course, as smart as possible. This is, this is the key word here. It should speak itself. The culture sh should be self-explanatory. We can't do over-promise. With employees and candidates, it's like with customers. For example, if we say that Skoda is a premium car and we say that experience of driving is amazing and the speed 
and the design is made out of only high quality materials like leather, wood, whatever. With once that person will have a, have arrived, it he, he or she will be disappointed. We will have a disappointed customer who will not recommend the product, the service to his or her friends. Saying that what, what they want to highlight here is that saying that something is standard isn't bad. It's honest. And we will find someone who is looking for a standard, who is looking for a job where uh, she or he can spend, can work from nine to five. If we say the truth, the better chance we will find someone who meets our expectation, someone who seeks for stability, someone who wants to work in a more predictive environment. And I appreciate work-life balance. However, today I would like to focus also on this group who, due to the fact, of, of course, that we have here some um, CEOs of scale-ups and startups, there are also people who are focused on career and who want to, who are not that, um, who do not care that much about stability and are okay with taking a risk and start working with startup scale-ups where the environment is less predictive. And here, I would like to refer to one of top brands, um, unicorns on the market that I had a chance to work with. This is a great example where the right communication, pretty straightforward, paid off. Um, I have on my mind Revolut. For the purposes of this presentation, when I was um, building it, I was surprised because I'm not working for Revel for around six months now. And surprising fact was that I can remember all the values by heart. I, I, was, I was surprised by that fact. And it made me start thinking, what is the reason? How did it actually happen? Well, I will tell you that in a few seconds, but first I would like to share with you what these values actually are. So um, at Revolut, this is, this is a snapshot of the, um, of the values. So at Revolut, they look for certain values. They are building a radically better banking experience for everyone. And in order to do that, they are guided by these values every day. So this is a dream team, never settle, think deeper, get it done, deliver well. And I can guarantee that these values, this is something that was alive in this company. And these values appeal to me. Um, I still remember my, um, my interview process when I had a meeting with um, my manager. And she told me that this is going to be a wild ride. That if I'm looking for a nine to five job, this is not the right place. I was... And what I value the most about during this interview process is that she was honest with me. My mindset was already, I was already mentally ready to join to a rocket ship. I was already prepared to do the great things. I was already prepared that I will be forced to do one step more. And the rest of the values that, are, that you can see here were also true. Revel this build of a dream team players. They never settle. What does it mean? Of course, this is pretty transparent here. It means that, of course, they are focused on generating great um, features to the app. But after delivering one, they are not stopping. They are moving further. They are never settling. And this is something that I value a lot about the company. And this is something that I would recommend everyone to do as much as possible because I, I'm also aware that it's not always possible. Okay, but having in mind the values and the culture and where they should be actually visible, how we can pitch them. Let me give you a few examples where these values should be visible. Everyday communication is one of them. Don't let the values die on the wall. It should be present in company announcement, in informal communication. And for example, um, let me refer one more time to Revolut. Um, Slack, I think that this is pretty common communicator among people who are here. I think that you all know that. And do you know that there is an option to customize the emojis icons? 
there is such an option. And Revolut customize it, use and put their, their uh, values. So try to imagine whenever there was some sort of announcement or communication, even in the private channels, employees were using these values. This this is something that was alive, and I was really I was really nicely surprised seeing that because later on when I was checking the stats of users of e, of each emojis, those which were which were representing values were one of the most oftenly used, which is which is really great because it means that people and that's also the reason why I remember them by heart even now. Don't be afraid to use the value, values in external communication, in communication with your clients. It will also show the human face of your brand and of your product. Where else? Values should be also present in the employee life cycle. And why we are doing it? We are putting values and the culture and the vision in everyday life because we want to make sure that in order that, that um, that we are surrounded only with people who are sharing the same values, who are sharing the same culture. Only then we will be able to deliver great projects. We will be able to be successful, to be trustworthy. So values in employee life cycle should be present at each step during the recruitment process, during the onboarding process, as well as in performance review process. This is not an easy thing. How to how to judge whether someone um, meet certain value or not but this is something doable and based on that you will be able to include values also in salary increase process as well as in the acts of recognition these are the tips that i would really appreciate you to take with you even after the meeting another thing that i would like to share with you are also some stats and here i would like to ask you a question can you afford to have employee turnover higher by 28%? They invest, invest wise in employer branding. That's, that's definitely true. Be transparent, pitch the culture, do not do over promise. But if you do it right, employee turnover can be reduced by 28% just by investing in employer brands. Um, after this meeting, I will be able to share with you the source of this data. Please also use smart ways of pitching candidates. Why am I talking about that? When we are doing marketing campaigns with our products and services, we, we are paying a lot for influencer marketing. And if it comes to employer branding, you have your influencers on board. Use them wisely. 98% of employees use at least one social media site for personal use, of which 50% are already posting about their company. I'm not saying that our employees, that your employees are going to be influencer with huge reach, but still, 50% is a lot. Try to put them in the center of your communication. Give them space, give them ability to pitch the company um, in the right way and try to benefit out of that. Another nice, uh, another nice stats that I would like to share with you um, is the authenticity. It's the, um, it's the fact that voice of our employees is three times more credible than the CEOs when it comes to talking about working condition in the company. These stats is something that I would like to leave you with because what we need to remember is that building the culture, sharing the values, this is something that starts with us and depends highly on us. It starts from the top to the bottom. And if we will not share the right example, we can't expect it to work. Of course, it gives us a lot of profits, but it's also a massive responsibility that's being put on our arms. And this is the last element that I would like to finish with. In a people top of mind.
you know, uh, history ju just shows that the first brain coming to the brain gain twice the long-term market share of the second one. For instance, if I, if I just ask you, um, what about a search engine? Uh, you all already think about Google. There is no other, uh, other view. If I just ask you about uh, um, electrical vehicle, all people think about Tesla, you know, and in the long term, they win the war. So it's really important to, to be top of mind uh, in, your, um, in your category users. And just for one reason, and it's, it's a very cognitive reason, it's because you have the same opinion than the group you are in. If you have another opinion, from people you are living with and all the people you are working with, you've got an error signal in your mind and you have to correct it. For instance, in, if in your um, entourage, people uh, have all an iPhone, you never buy an Android, an Android. You buy an iPhone because if you buy an Android, you get a signal, um, an error signal. So, um, developing a strong brand is, um, is not an option, it's an obligation. So the question is how we can do that? And to start, we just, we just want to, to, to speak about your own brand. So what we want now is just to have your feedback. Please go to the next slide. We want just to play together and define your brands into two minutes. So for instance, um, just write on the chat or just open your mic to tell us what is your brand or the brand you are working with, okay? Who wants to, who wants to start? Don't be shy. We need one of you. Yeah, I, 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 could, I, I, could, I could start. Um, define your brand in two minutes. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's a hard one. So that, that, that I, I, <laughs> um, so I, I have a travel company. Um, I would like to define yeah. my brand as um, redefining um, travel with spontaneity and experience. That's all. I don't know if okay. that's the right approach. Okay. S s thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mark. Interesting. Uh, anyone else want to share with us about his brand? Or we keep on the example of, of Mark? Well, and actually, I keep going with Mark. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say, I don't know if that was brand or mission statement. I'm still trying to fully understand no, what brand No worries. Is. No worries. We will explain us just after. Hello. Yes, Laurent. Yes, we are a media company. So it's BC and our mojo is take media to the next level. So this is it. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So Nick, what's your, what's your feedback about this brand. Do you understand them? I understand something about the brand, but uh, the fact is if I'm just looking at so many brands, uh, because I receive many information uh, every day, like on LinkedIn, on, uh, on all my social networks, and I'm just uh, making some research on Google, um, I only partly understand what you are doing. And the fact is, sometimes I miss something to get engaged in just like a few sentences. And that's a really complicated exercise uh, to um, just to have the, this ability to engage people in one or two sentences. For example, if uh, we talk about um, um, my company first, uh, I understand a mission. And yeah, I'm very curious about it, but I miss... Um, I miss the how you do that. And um, that's something very, very frustrating because if I 
it's it's really interesting but if i have no time maybe i will never go back to your brand and uh, this is something we have seen a lot of time with a brand that uh, define them themselves is that just missing a small part of information sometimes you lose attention of of people and typically also for absolutely for the media company it's the same for me it looks really interesting but if i am on a rush or whatsoever uh, i'm not going to i'm not going to stop and try to discover what you are doing and the the okay. purpose of the brand is really to make sure that people stop at you and st and start listening so how can we do now to uh, elevate your brand we just have a um, few few tools for that uh, by the way, just a, a short definition, in fact, how we can understand the brand. By Emily Herward, she is the founder of Fred Adler, uh, 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 an important um, uh, digital agency who is working with top, uh, top brand. First thing, start with the problem you are solving, okay? You need always to start when you define a brand, brand with a problem you are solving. And there is an amazing tool to use to be sure you are solving a great problem. Is the why test. Do you have any idea about what the why test is? No? Okay. So the, the question is, when you, you, you write the problem you are solving, ask you why. And with the answer, ask you why again. And if at the end, the answer is not the fear of death you are not solving a great problem it's not a fundamental problem you know so it's really important to use this test so for instance mark when you when you you, you have this question just ask why and at the end you are the fear of death okay you, ju just an example with uh, with airbnb uh, Airbnb. Um, if you if you go into this test, at the end it's fear of death because you have you have fear to do not have time to and to uh, to to spend uh, to with um, with amazing experience. You know, so it's fear of death. Second thing, it's about emotion. We speak about emotion. You get three type of ongoing. With your brands. First, it's about the problem you are solving. The, the second and the third are about the emotion you are able to generate and also the, the social ongoing of your brand. And it's really important to be to have uh, to align your own value with your brand. Just to give you a quick example. Uh, a few years ago now, Gillette. Uh, famous for their razor, um, want to communicate about uh, um, about the, the way they use women, they develop something for women and so on. So they have a very strong communication. They, they want to develop their brand into into this direction. But the problem is the pink tax. Do you have any idea what the pink tax is? If you compare the price of a razor for men and for women, such for women are, um, um, are higher, you know? You pay more if you are a woman. So you explain to me that you want to, to, to develop a um, uh, product for women. It's uh, equality uh, between gender is really important. And you create the pink tax. I'm not aligned about that. And last thing, make it personal. Define who are able to spread the words about your uh, your brand. Okay. If you use this three brick, you will be able to develop your brand. Please, Nick, go go ahead. So now, what we also want to explain is. Uh, and it's our also 
a module we've got from Proxy Mills. It's from gut feeling to data driven brand approach. You are able to find uh, KPIs, to find metrics, to evaluate your brands. And we divide it into three parts. Nick, you want to introduce the three uh, KPIs? Yeah, for, first of all, something that is really important to, uh, to uh, remember when we are speaking about brand KPIs is that for sure they are, they are not only one metric to monitor, but there can be, there are many potential KPIs and each, uh, each company will have different uh, KPIs to monitor. It could be for uh, the corporate branding or for employer branding. And um, first kind of KPI we, we have are uh, the one that we say it's traditional branding metrics uh, like the, uh, and we are speaking in the digital world. So like the, the traffic you have on your website, how many branded search uh, traffic you have, the shared search in, um, in search engine. Uh, and the same thing with shared voice for media and for social networks. Um, they are very like traditional branding metrics. You can ap apply them even for uh, campaign about your corporate branding or for your employer branding. The second type of metrics that could be also very interesting to, to, uh, to monitor are more dedicated normally to performance marketing metrics. Typically like a KPI like click through rate on a campaign or uh, conversion time you can have. It's something you can see on marketing campaigns in performance marketing, but not necessarily in um, in brand marketing. We think um, if you monitor these KPIs, it's really interesting to see what kind of trend you have on these KPIs. And because for sure campaigns can have different results, but if the trend is going, uh, uh, is going good on this kind of KPI, it means also that your brand is getting stronger. And typically if you make like uh, an email campaign uh, to your clients or to potential uh, employees. For sure, if you are a strong brand, you are more, uh, uh, you are more kind to have people click on, uh, on your email. And finally, we want also to speak about brand relationship metrics. It's something more and more important to consider that brands is not only made by uh, a company, but by people. That's why uh, it's, we know that we can have advocates, it could be internal advocates, so employees, funders, or external advocates, people that are just active and that really likes our brand. Something uh, that is really inter interesting because a uh, new KPI that not a lot of brands are monitoring, uh, they are saying, okay, um, if I, I have no advocate or I have one. But you can see how many activable advocates you can have. And it's really also interesting in terms of your audience, what kind uh, of people you can really activate or not. And when we speak about, for example, brand activable relationship, things about, about the people, not only saying, uh, like, for example, in influencer marketing, when you are uh, contacting some influencers, Many brands say, okay, um, is it possible to work with you at the beginning? And that's, that's not a, a nice way to behave in fact with, in, with influencers because they say, okay, I uh, don't know your brand. So um, maybe we'll send you uh, what could be the collaboration uh, rate or you, you won't answer you. And it's perfect. Thanks, thanks Nick. Just to go to, to the next slide because I see the time is running. We just want to, to make a short focus about uh, use case and uh, use case about sales process. Uh, I guess you're, you're all familiar with LinkedIn, you know? So on LinkedIn, you, you, you may receive a lot of cold message from salespeople who want to absolutely uh, introduce themselves and want to absolute, uh, absolutely uh, have a meeting with you. Most of the time, you just put them into the trash. Why? Because you don't know them. If you don't know them, you have uh, you refuse to um, to do business with a brand that you don't trust. 
So it's really important to develop your brands, but also the trust people have in your brands to develop your business. And to do that, you need to be very careful about what your sales people are doing. So employer branding, it's, 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 a, it's a huge topic also to develop your brands and your sales process. So just to give you uh, a short uh, example, you have to, to be very careful about caring. It means the brand cares about me as a person. And if you do that, it's correct. If you want to table the result, you need to, have, to be authentic. In other words, the brand has clear value and stays true to itself. And if you really want to have a uh, amazing result you need to work on a dependable approach uh, in other words i believe the brand is able to deliver um, promise benefits so it's really important to pick all this kind of message through your brand please nick so uh, i hope we we are clear and we give you some key to develop your brand and we convince you that you need to develop a strong brand. To help you, uh, we just introduced our beta program. It's a three month free program that will help you to boost your brand. And it's you've got dedicating and modeling to maximize the impact of the program. If you want, if you are interested in more details or you want to join, please send me an email to fred at foxiness.studio. We are, we are really happy to have this uh, workshop with you. We guess that we could help you and we are, uh, and if you have any question, please ask. No. Yeah, hi, no just, this, is, this is a quick one from myself. So, you know, the slide is really yep. interesting. You showed the different KPIs. So, does Foxy Nerd yep. help the clients monitor them digitally? Um, is that how do we Absolutely. apply those KPIs? That's the question. Oh, sorry. So, so the question is how, how how do we how how does how so that 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 unique yes this this slide you know how do we capture those data? Is it digitally? Is it manually? Does Foxy Nerd help the clients acquire those data? Uh, Foxy Nerd helps the clients to capture all these uh, KPIs. Yeah. All right. Interesting.